This is episode 13 of the Immunology Podcast, Pathogens, Autoantigens, and Antigens with Dr. Francis Lund. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today we have Dr. Frances Lund from the University of Alabama at Birmingham on the podcast to talk about her research identifying key players that suppress or exacerbate mucosal inflammatory responses, as well as a lot of B-cell biology and potential for intranasal vaccines. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and immunology news coming up, but first... We'd like to remind our listeners about the Immunology of Infectious Disease News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by the Stem Cell Science News Programs. Summarizing the latest research, jobs, news, and events in infectious diseases. Use Immunology of Infectious Disease News to stay current with the latest COVID-19, HIV, hepatitis, tuberculosis, influenza, and malaria research. Subscribe at www.immunologyofinfectiousdiseasenews.com. There we go. All right. Well, we are back for another roundup, Brenda. Are you safe where you are these days? I am. I don't think it's any better. It's sunny and beautiful here. Uh, Very dry as well, uh, which I heard is not the case for you. Yeah, yeah, no. Apparently, I live in Tornado Alley now where we got floods and tornadoes right in my little town here uh, this past week. So we're now disaster zone. Um, My basement is no longer swimming, but a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of our township got uh, pretty damaged. No police building anymore, no township building, high school and elementary school both got messed up pretty bad. A lot of houses. It's kind of crazy. So. Uh, Pennsylvania and like suburbs of Philly now has tornadoes. Who knew? That is, yeah, that is at the end of the world as we know it. I think that's the beginning. This is like a hundred years from now. This is going to be the start of the great, I don't know. Yeah, I think we broke something. I think we may have broken something. Yes, the weather. Okay, yeah. let's move on to other <laughs> other <laughs> things that are broken. All right. Well, what's broken our society these days is COVID. So I, of course, have another COVID paper for you. So Very this funny. one is targeting SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain to cells expressing CD40 improves protection to infection in convalescent macaws. It's Nature Communications. First author is Romain Marlin, and last author is Roger Legrand. Um, so this paper is an interesting one and I think it has to fight a really high uphill battle here, which it tries to do. And I, I, not to poo poo on it too much, but I don't think it did a great job of it, but I don't think it had to and tried to fight a battle. It didn't, but long story short, it is about, uh, the old style of vaccines where you make a protein that you then immunize people with. And so it, it looks at a um a basically a vaccine where they take um but the, but they have a technology to it where it's targeted so they take an antibody that targets cd40 so it pulls you know and then on the end on the other end of the antibody arm is the protein which is the receptor binding domain of the covid spike protein and so then it's going to cause immunization in cd40 positive cells by pulling them close together through association to then generate this response. So it's basically the very old style vaccine where you create an antigen, you inject it into people and generate a durable response. And they basically show that it works in mice and that, and then, and then they go into macaws. So so they have naive monkeys, previously exposed monkeys to COVID from other clinical studies that were convalescent. And then they then gave this vaccine to both of them and showed that there are higher spikes of neutralizing antibodies and a better durable immune response, but that you, and, and after challenge with COVID again, so they took regular monkeys, vaccinated them. They took monkeys that were previously exposed to COVID, vaccinated them, and then they challenged them with COVID. And then obviously with all the appropriate controls, they showed this really does work as a, almost like they're suggesting as a booster after the MRNA vaccines to really generate durable long-term uh neutralizing antibodies they unfortunately don't have the time data to show that this like lasts more than the eight months that we know mrna boosters do but they're arguing it's a different modality they can be easier to ship and move around because it's not a lipid vesicle 
but they they try to say, oh, we need you know to solve this crisis of the pandemic, we need all the different types of vaccines, and so you should use this technology too. They don't really make a good compelling case for that, but they do make a compelling case that this vaccine also works in the tool belt, and so I think they really show that this technology works. This is kind of their version of the vaccine, so their kind of technology is taking an anti-CD40 antibody and adding on to the other end the um, their target, in this case, receptor binding domain, but they've also known as HIV in the past. And so this technology demonstrates that it works um, and it can dur generate a durable response, basically. And so I think it's good, but I also think that now people are trying to fight for like, my vaccine is good, better than your vaccine. And, you know, this is the reason you need this type and that type. And I don't think they made this super compelling in this case. I guess that making, mon making antibodies with a modified domain, the RBD, must be easier than making mRNA uh, lipoparticles, maybe also cheaper easier to to like make it like the process is probably you can do it in, in in cheaper places and without such specialized infrastructure but so basically what they're doing is they are looking into targeting this uh epitope with antigen to the right cells so those cells are expressing cd40 those will be cells that are probably likely to to be good apcs for uh and you don't need to have an adjuvant that is usually the case for other more traditional vaccines. Right. But it's still a subunit type and antigen based versus right. being an mRNA based. So yeah, so it's an interesting technology. I don't I don't dislike it. I think it's pretty cool. It's just that everyone now seems to be tilting at the vaccine windmill. Yeah. But I think well actually what I would like to see is well, I don't know. I sometimes just think that all their all these vaccines are all focusing so much on the spike protein. Uh, I wonder whether we should also be looking at vaccines that have other antigens or even those of uh, the few inactivated virus vaccines that are in the, are available in the market, which those are, I would say, the most traditional type of yeah. vaccines, the oldest in the toolbox. Well, because I, then you, you end up having a immune response that is probably closer to the natural. When, when you do have the response, you have other epitopes to respond to. Yeah, well, they've done we, some studies. I think we covered some of this, that, that antibodies to other proteins don't generate prevention of infection because a spike protein exactly. is how yeah. the cells enter. And so they want to generate an antigenic response to spike protein because that's the only way you're going to stop the, yeah. the virus from entering and thus then replicating. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. There's not really a lot of use in making response against the capsid. Right. Um, I mean, it'll be there in people, but I don't think it helps. Yeah. Well, it looks like still we're still having some issues with the protection. Uh, did you hear those new the this whole con controversy with this new publication that came out that were comparing natural immunity against uh, vaccination immune vaccination in Israel? No, I hadn't seen that one. I know we had covered that a second shot is basically you know exposure plus shot is the same as two shots. But what what's this one? Well, this one, I, I didn't want to, I don't think we're ready to talk about it here because it has, it's only now in BioArch, okay. archive, I think. And they're talking about how it looks like you have better protection against the Delta variant, uh, convalescent. So people that are uh, sort of recovered from a COVID infection have a better neutralizing uh, response against uh, Delta than people that were vaccinated. Probably because they have such high but titers, but that makes sense because there's so much variability. Yeah. And yeah, how I sick mean, you they got. did get COVID, so that's also not great. It's not like you're gonna just yeah. Some anti-vaxxers are using this to say, well, see, uh, all, all this, all this effort for nothing. It's better to get infected, but that's of course not what the authors yeah. were aiming at. But now it's a uh, quite a storm. Well, it's um, something like the third shot in Israel's dropping uh, transmission and serious infection by an order of magnitude. All right, so that's good. It's interesting. All right. Well, I think you, right. you're up next. Um, do you also have a COVID paper to share with the class? No, I refuse. I'm going to talk about other cool stuff that's going in the immunology world. Uh, and, you know, I'm because I'm biased, I'm going to talk about T-cells. Uh, so bear with me here. You know, um, have you thought of talking about a vaccine? What if I tell you you can use T-cells as vaccines? Like the T cell is the thing you give people? Yes. 
And the purpose for the T cell is to deliver the antigen. I'm going to say that's a hell of a clinical trial. Yeah. So what they do in this, in this publication, uh, I think it's very interesting, is they use T cells to deliver antigen and you, therefore work as vaccines. First author, Joshua Veach from the lab of Stanley Riddle at Fritch Hutchinson's uh, Institute in Seattle and was published in JCI. Uh, titled, A Therapeutic Cancer Vaccine Delivers Antigens and Adjuvants to Lymphoid Tissue Using Genetically Modified T-Cells. So T-Cells can do it all. What do you do? Basically, they have they start with mice mo mouse models. They have T-Cells that are expressing uh, a, a, a fuse protein, a truncated C19 protein, together with a model antigen, uh, or in this case, OVA, for CD8 responses, and a listeria-derived um, uh, antigen from for the CD4 responses, and they um, they generate these cells and they inoculate them, so they inject them into mice, and then they look into the uh, induction of T cell responses against OVA and this LLO peptide uh, from hysteria. And you know, very interestingly, they do see that uh, you can actually generate robust responses against these antigens by in injecting the cells. And what is interesting, I think, is also very, very cool, is that after uh, for so the, you have the peak of the response around 14 days, and around that time also you have a purge of all the transgenic cells get uh, degraded because they are they are expressing this antigen. So they not only they're kind of self uh, self cleaning also a system. Uh, what is so? But they, they see they see this. They see that the T cells are really um, trafficking into the lymph nodes, into the, the spleen, um, and they see that within the lymph nodes, there are dendritic cells that are, are taking taking up the components of this uh, what they call Tvax cells. Uh, they are uh, which then they cross present to to stimulate the response. Interestingly enough, T cells also present themselves these antigens through MHC1 and MHC2, which is also expressed on activated T cells. So these are kind of transient expression of particularly HLA-DR. And, and what, what they, they do next is they look into uh, the chance of adding cost-immunatory molecules or cytokines to this construct that they, uh, they transduce the cells with. So they express this target antigens, but then also other things to enhance their response. And they test different cost-immunatory molecules and they test different cytokines. And they come to the conclusion that having, on top of the antigen that they're presenting, having expression of GMCSF and IL-12 on these cells also further enhances their response uh, in mice against the, the antigens care that the cells are carrying. And they, they show that the GMCSF and IL-12, IL-12, that is actually membrane uh, tethered, so it's bound to the membrane, so it's not like released. Uh, act through different, their kind of non, uh, non, non overlapping effects. On the one hand, GMCSF uh, increases uh, the the uh, in increases the the expression of certain markers on on the antigen presenting cells, such as CD103, improves the um, more of the, the DC part of the of the equation. And they show that IL-12, this membrane tethered IL-12 increases the expression of interferon gamma by the, the T cells. And what is very interesting is that they show that it's actually acting in an, an endocrine manner, I'm sorry, para, uh, endocrine, paracrine manner, and it's stimulating the, the transgenic cells to express uh, interferon gamma. And so they also show that they could replace this, the IL-12 that these cells are producing can also be replaced by just a uh, constitutively active um, IL-12 receptor, and then can, without having to uh, uh, generate IL-12, which can also be toxic for the patient receiving the cells. Uh, they move on from this kind of more, um, what's the word, model antigens. They look into some uh, neoantigens, and they can also see that they can generate neoantigen-specific responses in mice, and they also test it with, with uh, human cells, and again, they show that they are capable of uh, doing, generating a, a new antigen-specific responses in a, in a way that is stronger than, for example, using 
dendritic cells loaded with the peptides that are trying to uh, um, raise the response against. And I think in general, what is really cool about using T cells for this purpose is that T cells are really easy to manipulate. And there we have a lot of already uh, protocols in hand to isolate them, uh, transduce them with vir virally, to, to introduce basically any gene we want. And that's much easier to manipulate than, for example, dendritic cells and load the peptides on dendritic cells, which uh, can are harder to get and are harder to expand and to prepare. So in general, I think it was very cool, uh, interesting uh, kind of approach at vaccination. That's a really interesting approach. I guess I'm wondering if you switch this to humans, how are you going to create the T cells that behave well with your own immune system? Are you going to have to take your own person's a patient's T cells out, modify it, and then put it back in? Because you're not going to be able to create a pool then, right? You can just give yeah. the people a vaccine. So they do show that you so they have this in principle with... Uh, um, Kind of yeah the 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 the, hum, uh, the um the, the same cells so they they use endogenous T cells, uh, but they also look into having HLA match T cells, or uh, having allogeneic T cells, and the best response is observed with with endogenous T cells. But um, they also they really I think of course having having the option of doing allogeneic uh, products would be much better. Um, but the idea is that these cells will also not survive very long because they're expressing this, um, this peptide or so they're expressing this antigens that will kind of induce, they will be targeted by the host immune system. So they will probably be like, yes, that they will be, uh, cleared out fairly quickly. Yeah. I'm just, I'm wondering if that immune response will be too robust in some way that will then have effects on efficacy, but that, that's a problem for them. To sort out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to go R squared. I'm going to review a review. <laughs> All right. So this one is called Dendritic Cell Functions in the Inductive and Effector Sites of Intestinal Immunity. It's in Mucosal Immunology. Uh, first author is Cecilia Luciani, and last author is Hugues Leolard. And it is a pretty good review uh, for people like me, especially who love. Uh, intestinal immunology and appreciate all its glory. Uh, and it really goes into what dendritic cells do. And so being a review, I'm not going to go over all the points in it. It is long and people should read it if they're interested. But if you're in the dendritic cell field or the intestinal immunology field, it's worth the read. And in particular, I wanted to point out a couple things I thought were interesting, which is one is that they really cover the idea that not there's there's different types of dendritic cells which we know but even given the same general type there's subtyping that comes out based on where that dendritic cell is located so lamina propria cells in the small intestine are different than lamina propria dendritic cells in the large intestine in particular the small intestinal lamina propria cells seem q to generate tolerance from what they uptake, which generally is more food particles, whereas the large intestine, which has bacteria, generate less tolerance and tend to be more immunogenic. However, oddly, if you give something PR or per rectum, instead, the large intestinal dendritic cells will, in that case, then generate tolerance to it. So it seems that if something goes through the aliment is introduced exogenously to, through to the alimentary canal by rectum or by mouth, then the dendritic cells in those regions will generate tolerance, but not so much if there's a pathogenic bacteria or something else that's or, or commensal. So you don't have, you know, it shows there's not necessarily high tolerance to commensals through this mechanism, but rather that they're just not supposed to be in the lamina propria, which is what we know to be the case. Uh, they also then go on and kind of talk about how there's different functions in the, the isolated lymphoid follicles, the Peyer's patches, and other uh, gut-associated lymphoid tissues, or known as GALT, and how because these different immune, like you want to call them immune organs or immune sub-organs, have different exposure to luminal contents at baseline, how much mucus covers them, how much antimicrobial peptides are present, they all have different tunings such that if you're covered in bugs all the time, you're going to be more tolerogenic. But if you're not supposed to sense bugs ever, 
um, you're going to be less tolerogenic. And then which ones have access to this, those sensing M cells that, you know, suck up antigens and then present it. And so they go into this in pretty good detail. The other really good thing uh, for, I think, a lot of our audience will be if you're looking at um, in uh, any of these cells in general, so mouse intestinal phagocyte markers, generally speaking, they have a great kind of table that splits up macrophages and various DCs and the various markers that one should use in their levels. Uh, so that if you need to do your own flow or any other experiments, it helps you kind of ferret that out with a lot of in-depth detail. So this is something that you usually find only on a BioLegend site or something like that for like, this is how you find the markers for an ILC3 or something. They go into sub sub populations of DCs here with a pretty good table. I thought that was really useful too. So if you're starting to have to delve in and figure out what your DC is up to, it gives you a pretty good set of markers to go off of. So I thought it was a really useful review, um, targeted, right? So if you don't study dendritic cells in the intestine, it's probably not super helpful. But if you do at least one of those two things, it's, it's, it's worth the read. Well, thank you for that public service announcement uh, for all the immunologists looking into the dendritic cells populations in the gut and beyond. It is the most important organ. All right, all right. I would argue the most important organ is the brain. That's where our, our all of our self is lying, I guess. All right, well, well now, now I have to tell you my joke because you set this up for me. Perfect, you've fallen into my trap. So a brain, a heart, and a intestine are in a bar arguing. And the brain goes, I'm the most important organ because without me, you can't think. And the gut goes, no, 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 heart, I'm the most important organ because without me, you can't, you know, you don't beat, you know, you, there's no circulation, you die. And the gut goes, no, 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 I'm the most important organ. And then the brain and the heart go, oh, come on, what do you do? And says, go to the bathroom right now. Heart, brain, go, yes, okay. <laughs> and this is why the heart, the heart and the brain just follow the gut. Okay. All right, I'll give you that. I'll give you that if that makes you happy. Okay, my turn now. Second paper of the day. Uh, I think it's very cool because, I mean, Jason, are you, are you usually stressed? Does stress play a big role in your life? More lately, especially with tornadoes and intending, you know, ecological doom. Yes, that sounds stressful. I uh, you know how, you know, sometimes your grandma would say, don't get so stressed because that will give, make you like grow old or, you know, that's not good for your health. Give you so an ulcer. Yeah. It give you an ulcer, things like that. Well, this is a paper that shows that being stressed is bad for your immune system in very specific ways. Uh, so chronic stress rhymes innate immune responses in mice and humans. Uh, published in Cell Reports, first author Tessa Barrett from the lab of Catherine Moore at New York University. And in this paper, they look into uh, stressing out little little mice and relating this uh, psychological stress with systemic inflammation. So we know that psychological stress can lead to systemic inflammation. And, uh, and this is, there are, some, there are different kind of mechanisms by which this uh, can be the case. Uh, some of them have to do with the production of... Um, for example, adrenaline that activates particular receptors in the bone marrow, and that can, for example, increase the production of the output of uh, hemato hematopoietic stem cells and progenitor cells, and have, then you have more immune cells that are being pumped out of the bone marrow. Um, so they also start from this knowledge that there are ways that, that psychological stress can induce inflammation. And they also look into, start with the fact that monocytes have been shown to be able to retain some kind of memory or of past immunological insults of, on a way so they can get kind of primed and then be more hyper responsive and they so they basically the they, they look into the relationship between uh, psychological stress and the profile of monocytes so they take mice and they generate a model of chronic stress so basically they take the poor mice and they change their bedding they rattle the cage they overcrowd the cage they put them in solitary and this generates a lot of psychological stress on the mice and then they look into uh the 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 
the blood, the, the PBMCs in the blood, and they look into the levels of, of bone marrow progenitors and uh, hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells that are produced in the bone marrow. And they see that they don't see, as had been kind of previously shown, uh, differences in the level of CXCL12, uh, which is uh, the reduction of which is one of the ways through which uh, uh, norepinephrine, for example, can uh, influence the output of the bone marrow. But, uh, and they don't really measure in the end differences in the leukocytes, monocytes, or neutrophils in the blood, although they do, they do see differences in the uh, hematopoietic stem cell um, progenitors. What they look, when they look closer into the monocytes in the bone marrow and the mice, however, they do uh, identify transcriptional differences in, uh, uh, between normal mice and stressed mice uh, they see different uh, expression of molecules related to pro-inflammatory signaling, uh, re uh, reactive oxygen species, and certain pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, and, and, their, and their pathways, such as N-kappa beta, IL-6. They also see differences in inflammasome activation, all tr transcriptional. Uh, they also look into the chromatin landscape, and they see different uh, uh, this different chromatin accessibility for genes related to, for example, inflammasome and the production of IL-6. And they also look into, they also find differences in the metabolic profile of these cells. So they basically can see that there is something that these monocytes are, are kind of clearly different between control and stressed mice. Um, and, they, and they conclude that this psychological stress can skew these myeloid cells towards their high, what they call a hyperinflammatory status. And so they, as I mentioned, they see differences in, in traditionally metabolic genes such as uh, mTOR and uh, also uh, P13K. Um, and when they take this the monocytes from the bone marrow of stress mice compared to control, and they, for example, co-culture them with LPS, they see that stressed monocytes produce more IL-6, more TNF-alpha, and they're also more phagocytic when co-culture with, for example, E. coli. Um, and so this is kind of really shows that there's something that the psychological stress is doing to the monocytes, which makes them hyper-responsive in mice. Interestingly, they were all female mice. And also, they have a cohort of women that are, in a, an, a, are included in a study for myocardial infra infraction. And they see, so they have this data from these women, and they have uh, monocytes or PBMCs derived from these women. And they, they are classified according to kind of the psychological scale for psychological stress. And they compare women that, that uh, uh, have a low score and women that have a high score. And they also do a uh, whole uh, blood RNA-seq from the PMCs of these women. Uh, and they also see similar patterns to what we're observing in mice and basically increase an increase in the, in the transcript of inflammatory pathways, interferon, the interferons, IL-6, and NF-kappa beta. And so they, they show that they're kind of quite comparable in that sense. When they take... Uh, when they take the monocytes from uh, this, this from stressed women, they uh, they can also uh, they also see that they are more uh, sensitive to TLR stimulation and they generate more pro-inflammatory cytokines. And what is also interesting that is that they also have higher absolute counts of neutrophils and monocytes in the patients that have uh, higher stress. Um, so basically, they 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 show that uh, what is sad is that they don't really look closer into the mechanism. So it's not clear how how are these monocytes being influenced into these changes, but they seem to have found a correlation or a between the the psychological stress and a very specific profile of the monocytes, which can then. Uh, affect you know systemic inflammation more generally so don't get stressed out it's bad for your monocytes apparently now then that they did stressed women but not men in, in patients yeah isn't that ironic what were we talking yes. the other day about women underrepresented i'm yeah. not sure why they don't explain why they they do this in, in in female mice and in women only maybe they only had this cohort of patient <sighs> information from from a group of women maybe i don't remember this super well i thought there is a sexual dimorphism between stress and immune responses between men and women i think in part because of the sex hormones 
and the need to be able to drive immunosuppression during pregnancy. But I wouldn't want to be like, you know, quoted on that without getting the papers out. But I think it's related to that. So it may be that there's a better signal than noise there because there's already built-in pathways for a non-pathogenic version of this response for, uh, you know, caring children. So that, that's my Could guess. Be. Could be. So that was it. That was my my two cents for this week's uh, roundup. I thought, I hope you enjoyed it. I did very much so. And uh, yes, maybe, maybe maybe your turn for a COVID paper next time and I can be done for a bit. We'll see. We'll All see right. I'll take, I'll take the lead in that. All right. Well, we're going to be speaking to Dr. Francis Lund at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in just a moment. But before we get to that, explore scientific resources for your immunology research at the Stem Cell Technologies Immunology Learning Center. Choose from different research areas and find expert interviews, technical tips, educational webinars, instructional videos, and much more. Visit stemcell.com slash immunology hyphen research. Joining us today is Dr. Frances Lund. She's the Charles H. McCauley Professor and Chair of the Department of Microbiology and Founding Director of the Immunology Institute at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Her lab investigates the role that innate and adaptive cells play in immune responses to pathogens, autoantigens, and allergens, and has made some very important contributions to understanding the role of B cells in coordinating immune responses. Uh, Professor Loon, thank you so much for joining us today. Really happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. So uh, let's dive right in. Before we get to the most, uh, I think, topical of the things I wanted to ask you about today, I figured we could start in with with B cells and immunity there and really uh, kind of your overall program and what you've really shown and how you can how B cell immunity isn't just, oh, it pops out an antibody. Yes. Um, so more than 20 years ago, when, um, well, actually I should start by saying I've worked on B cells my entire career, which is more than 25 years. And when I started my studies, even as a graduate student, B cells were really thought of this as the cells that pop out antibody, right? That's their job. And that is their job. So I, I would never say that antibody made by B cells is unimportant. It's the most critical thing that they do. But I think what we've come to appreciate over the last 20 years is that B cells have other roles as well, and that those roles are also important for coordinating immune responses. And when I was a postdoc, I worked at a company called DNAX, which was in Palo Alto, California. And that was a company that was uh, owned by Sharon Clow and, and really focused on cloning cytokines and cytokine receptors. And in fact, Th1 and Th2 cells were defined uh, by Bob Kaufman and Tim Mossman at DNAX. And so that paper came out of DNAX. So the focus was really on cytokines. And it was clear that B cells made cytokines but nobody actually thought about what those cytokines might do that were made by B cells. And so that's where I first got interested in asking, what are some of the other functions that B cells might have? And so for a number of years, we sort of concentrated on what are the alternate functions that B cells perform in addition to differentiating and producing antibody secreting cells uh, and an antibody that can help clear pathogens. And um, one of the things that we showed probably 15 or more years ago now, is that some of the cytokines that are made by B cells regulate the quality of the T cell response that's made. And that turns out to be important because around the same time that we were showing that, people were first starting to use a drug called rituximab in the clinic, and rituximab depletes B cells. And the idea was that if you depleted B cells, you would lose antibodies, and the antibodies that were important in autoimmunity would go away and people would recover from their autoimmune disease, whether it was lupus or RA or things like that. And one of the things that came out of those studies was that in many cases, you got rid of the B cells. You didn't touch the antibody because the antibody was being made by plasma cells and plasma cells weren't depleted by this drug, rituximab. Yet in many cases, disease uh, improved or disease got better in in some of these, for example, RA patients. And so the idea was, well, then B cells must do something else in addition to antibody, because antibody is still there, but yet you got rid of your B cells and your disease uh, morbidity scores uh, uh, improved. And so that sort of led into this idea that 
B cells must contribute other functions. And the cytokines that are made by B cells is one of the places where we concentrated and show that those cytokines can influence the quality of the T cell responses that are generated, whether those T cells um, um, move on to becoming memory cells um, and the quality of the memory cells that are generated. And, and since that time, uh, there's lots of other things that cytokines made by B cells have been shown to do. It's important in cancer. It's important in lots of different settings, more than just regulating um, T cells, it regulates macrophages, dendritic cells, et cetera. And so it's pretty clear now that just like we think about T cells modulating their microenvironment by producing cytokines, B cells do the same thing. And, you know, in retrospect, it's not surprising, but at the time, it was sort of an unusual way to think about these cells. It's very interesting to see, of course, the the coordination or the relationship between this, this different type of adaptive uh, immune cells. So in your research, where is, so we know that usually when we think of, of B cell, T cell interactions, we're thinking of helper T cells in the germinal centers, for example. Is that also where B cells mostly affect, for example, T cells or other immune cells? Or where do you think the, the different niches for B cell inf influence lie? Yeah. Um, so that's a really good question. I think the answer is that there's probably lots of places. So I can give you an example. B cells make a uh, cytokine called lymphotoxin, and that's important for organizing uh, secondary and even tertiary lymphoid tissues. And so you can imagine that B cells, they don't have to be in a germinal center to make that cytokine. And modulating B cell production of that cytokine actually changes the these, the, the structures that are within those tissues and the kinds of cells that are recruited in and their interactions with other cells. So that's just one example. B cells can interact with T cells in the germinal center. And that's absolutely true. And, and we know that B cells get important signals from the TFH cells, the germinal center TFH cells at that site. But we also know that the maintenance of TFH cells is highly dependent on B cells. And that's true both in the germinal center, but it's also true um, at extra follicular sites. And so, you know, the development of TFH cells is really dendritic cell dependent. And so if you're lacking dendritic cells, you don't get TFHs, but you also don't get TFHs if you don't have B cells. And so that's a step that's really important. And that step is not happening in the germinal center, that's happening outside of it. And finally, B cells can clearly interact with um, I'll call them effector T cells, both CD4s and CD8s, because B cells can present antigen through class two and through class one. And when B cells come into a secondary lymphoid tissue, they actually transit through the T cell area before going to the follicle. And during that time, they can interact with T cells. And so those are also places where those interactions can, can drive responses. All right. Well, so to segue into uh, some of your more recent work and going back to B cells being antibody factories, uh, we can discuss everyone's favorite virus, which is COVID. Uh, we can say SARS-CoV-2, but it takes too long. So I'm, I'm fine with being slightly less technical and saying COVID. Uh, with that being said, you, you're working on a very interesting vaccination strategy, uh, which I think is really important to discuss and so maybe you could give a high level view of it and how mucosal immunity differs from other forms of immunity and why different immunoglobulin classes matter. And then maybe we can, if we have time, also talk about how not all antibodies are neutralizing antibodies or there's different concepts to this in sterile immunity, which I think is things people are getting confused by because uh, everyone's yeah. used to getting a measles shot and never getting the measles versus something yes. like a coronavirus. Yes. So um, one of the things that we've been interested in for a very long time is uh, immunity at local sites. And in particular, we've been over the last 20 years focused on pulmonary immunity and upper respiratory tract immunity, which would be, you know, the, the nasal passages, the throat and the lung. And that's a, an important site of immunity because lots of things come in via that route, including coronaviruses. Um, but we you know, over the years have studied influenza um, and then switched to um, coronaviruses uh, after the outbreak. And the, the thing that I think is important is that immunity at local sites differs in the type of immunity that's generated 
Um, and that matters a lot. And so what I mean by that is that if you get, for example, a systemic vaccination, like you get in, as an intramuscular injection, um, you will generate B cells and T cells that are specific for that vaccine's antigens. And those cells will primarily uh, go to secondary lymphoid tissues where they will reside and live as memory cells. Um, you will get plasma cells that can be long lived and they will go to the bone marrow where they will secrete antibody that it can be found circulating. So when we measure serum antibody titers. What doesn't happen with a systemic vaccine is that you don't put cells in the mucosa that are memory cells. And that most of the cells might circulate through those sites, but they won't reside there. And with a mucosal vaccination, one of the things that's pretty exciting about it is that you generate cells systemically because you get it in your secondary lymphoid tissues, the draining lymph nodes, but you also get immunity at the site. And those cells will reside there and can be called, in many cases, resonant memory cells. You get resonant memory T cells and B cells, and they sit at that interface and they're memory cells. So they can respond much faster than uh, a naive cell can when they get rechallenged. And the difference between that and a systemic vaccine is that in a systemic vaccine, those cells are in the secondary lymphoid organs. So they have to wait for the antigen to get there. Then they have to respond and then they go to the site. And that takes time, days. Um, and if you have memory at a mucosal site, you can reactivate that memory in a much shorter period of time. And I think that's really important because it just allows you to start responding to a virus that replicates really fast, like the Delta variant, uh, a couple days earlier. They also have different effector functions when they're at that site, and I'd be happy to talk about those. And one of the differences in the effector functions is the antibody the kind of antibody that is made. And so local immune cells that are at mucosal sites, they will often make IgA as the isotype of antibody. And IgA is very different than IgG because it has another protein attached to it called J chain. And J chain can be used by receptors to transudate that antibody across the epithelium and into secretory sites. So then you can put the antibody really at the interface where the virus is coming in. Do you think that is the, the key to sterilizing immunity against this respiratory viruses? Is there a path for, can we achieve sterilizing immunity? I would not say that that's sterilizing immunity. What I would say is that is faster immunity and more local immunity. It does not say that it's sterilizing at all. But I think one of the important points about it is that when you have a faster immune response, then even if your antibodies are not sterilizing, you ramp up that response much faster and you have cellular immunity where cellular immunity is, is also effective in removing viruses. You have T cell immunity that can kill virally infected cells. You have antibodies that maybe are not neutralizing, but can help with activating the dendritic cells and all the other things that need to happen to clear antigen. And so, that response just goes faster. And because it's a broader response and it goes faster, then even things that are like variants may be able to be cleared through this sort of less than neutralizing response, but um, you know, still a, um, it, it, it removes it just faster, right? So that you're, you're infectious for less, off, for less time, you get less ill, and that's why you don't end up in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know that I would say that it, you, you get more neutralizing. You might, but that's not a requirement. So along those lines, I know you're working on a nasal vaccine for COVID um, without, you know, violating any things you can't talk about, because I, I know that very well working in industry myself. Um, can you talk about it? Is it an mRNA or is it an adenoviral vector? Is it just raw antigen? So there's there's at least seven different vaccines that are being tested right now for intranasal delivery. Um, and most of them are either an antigen, like a recombinant antigen, or an adenovirus. At least, to my knowledge, no one has yet tested one of the RNA-based vaccines 
as an intranasal delivery. And that may be because when you think about it, it's a different subset of cells that you need to target with your vaccine. And maybe they're quite ready to do that you know, with the RNA-based vaccines. I don't know. But at least for ours, it was an adenovirus vector vaccine. So the idea is that it, it's a non-replicating virus, um, but it will express spike and you should get a response, a local response to that spike antigen. Um, the, 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 I would say that the downside to the vaccine, at least the one that we worked on, is it worked great in preclinical modeling, but we could give a lot of it to an animal. And one of the things that you have to think about with an intranasal vaccine is that you have to get through what they call the calyx. Um, and that's that's a barrier, right? It's a straight up barrier that you've got to get your adenovirus through. And it can be done, but it takes a lot of virus. And I think from a practical point of view, that turned out to be somewhat difficult to do that with a priming dose of the virus because you needed to get so much in. I think these intranasal vaccines may be much more effective as booster shots. In other words, you get your intramuscular vaccine first, you develop systemic immunity, then you come in with an, um, a vectored vaccine, like an adenovirus vectored vaccine, intranasally, and you pull those cells to the mucosal site, your memory cells, and then they'll reside there. And so this is very similar to some of the experiments that have been done and tested um, with sort of that prime pull approach uh, for vaccination in you know, the vaginal tract and other places, right? It's the same idea. And why is it that we don't have against other uh, respiratory viruses such as influenza? I know they have that there's always this idea that nasal vaccines could be used, but they're not really in the market, are they? Well, for flu, there is. It's called LAIV, and it is um, approved for children and up to about age 55 for adults. I think it's somewhere in that range, 50, 55. Uh, so those are approved vaccines. They work. They work great in kids. Um, and in that case, uh, that is with a, a modified influenza virus. So it's, a, it's an attenuated influenza virus. Um, I think part of the reason it hasn't been done for some of the other vaccines is it's expensive to develop and we have vaccines that work, right? So we don't need to go make something new, but coronaviruses may be an example of a kind of virus where it's going to be difficult to achieve sterilizing immunity that lasts for long periods of time. And so we might, either because the virus mutates enough that there's enough variants that you have to adapt by boosting, or that the response to the virus vaccine doesn't last for long enough that we have to go back and boost. And so this might be the example of a place where that intranasal vaccination is actually gonna be something that is worth the time and the investment cost to try and build something that would be better. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the environment that you're conducting your research in because you, you've completed one of the uh, couple's goals of my life. So I'm also married to a scientist. Okay. Um, and I know that you you work with your partner, I believe, in, yeah. a, in a joint lab. So I don't know if you could comment on that. Did you guys go to grad school together and then go all the way through, meet as postdocs, meet after you had labs? Do, how does lab meeting operate? Because my wife and I are always really nervous about uh, uh, of that because we tend to go at it like the married Jewish couple that we are, as the joke <laughs> goes. We, we, we lean yeah. into that stereotype. So I just wanted to know if you could comment on that. So, yes. Um, so I met my husband in graduate school. We were in the same um, graduating class or whatever you want, incoming class in graduate school at Duke. Um, met him the first day. We ended up in the same lab. And about a year later, we started to date. Um, and we've been together for more than 30 years now. So we went through grad school together, postdoc, and all of the job changes that we've made. And it's, you know, it's not trivial to find two jobs in the same city and all those things that go with that. Um, but it was important to us. And so that was something we prioritized. Um, we fight a lot and we fight in lab meetings. <laughs> So we definitely do that. And you can sometimes see that everybody else is sort of looking around the room while we have our, I wouldn't do it, that kind of approaches. But, you know, at, at the same point, I think having that ability to not be um, 
inhibited about you know, those kinds of conversations have actually pushed our science in ways that maybe I would not have pushed it with somebody else, right? Um, so being confident enough that I can afford to argue with this person um, made us both come up better scientists in the long run, probably. So, so to follow up on that one, I, I, as I've experienced this as well, but kind of differently now, when you were, when you said navigating different career paths, different locations, going along, I we have we have a lot of postdocs and grad students listen to the podcast, and they may not be in the exact same boat where it's two people in the same field from the same training program in the same lab, but a lot of people do meet in grad school, undergrad, postdoc, go together. They're looking for two faculty jobs in the same city or same institution, or maybe very different departments. I know history PhD married to a science PhD type of things. Do you have any? words of wisdom that you can pass on as, as you having done this so successfully yeah. that I think our audience would be interested in? So I, I think one of the most important things is to be honest enough about what each person's goals are so that you can try and find a place that will accommodate both sets of goals and to be flexible um, in that you won't find a place that is perfect for both of you necessarily, but if you pick out what are the three things that you think are most important um, and are willing to compromise on some of the things that are maybe a little bit less important, um, hopefully you can find the best fit. Um, but I think the most important thing is to be adaptable um, and to recognize that each person has a different set of strengths and that what is works for one person may not work for the other, but you need to be looking for both because obviously your marriage won't work out very well or your partnership won't work out very well um, if both people aren't happy. So at the end of the day, it's more about being happy than where do you end up in your career? I mean, to be honest, you know, it's great. We ended up where we did, but that, that was not my primary goal. Adage happy wife equals happy life is one that I have, I have very well learned. <laughs> that, that is important. <laughs> That's such a great, such a great story to hear. Uh, it must it must be challenging, but also very very um, rewarding to 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 share this with your partner. I want to just go back a little bit to to the science. I, I'm really I really like how many in, in general in immunology there's so many aspects, so many faces to the same cells. And now we've talked talking about B cells. We talked about the the goodness of B cells and the importance of getting B cells in the right place at the right time, and making the right antibody. Um, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about any of your research that, that looks into B cells gone bad or B cells associated to autoimmunity or to uh, pathogenic uh, or, or in disease uh, circumstances. Sure. So. One of the things that I think about a lot when we study immune cells, whether it's a B cell or another cell, is what did they really evolve to do? And from my perspective, that's why I took the first job that I did, which was at an infectious disease institute, because it's my firm belief that the immune system really evolved to deal with pathogens. And if you can understand that, and why the cells do what they do in response to pathogens, it will inform you about why things go wrong, whether that's in the setting of um, chronic disease that's associated with infection, or whether that's autoimmunity or allergy or um, cancer, for example. And so that's how we, how I always come at those questions. And um, in terms of thinking about when B cells go bad, most of the time the B cells are doing exactly what they have been trained to do. Um, but the environment is not right. And so they are responding in an inappropriate way to, well, maybe even in an appropriate way to an inappropriate environment. And so when we think about it, we, what we try to understand is how we can intervene in that process in a way that will stop the bad without stopping the good. And you know, one of the things that I think a lot about is a lot of the therapies that are used to treat autoimmune disease really are just immunosuppressants, right? And as we can see based on just this COVID vaccination um, experience that we're having, people who are on long-term immunosuppression, for example, transplant patients, 
need to get that third shot, right? And so what you've done is by suppressing the bad, you've also suppressed the ability to, to, to respond in a way that is good. Um, and so what we would like to understand are there particular pathways that get induced in, in a bad setting that we might intervene with that would not impair completely their ability to respond to, for example, a vaccine. And so that's how we sort of approach our questions. Um, and in particular, over the years, we've again concentrated on some of these non-antibody dependent functions of B cells and asking if we can intervene at those steps, because if we can, then maybe we can prevent them from becoming plasma cells and making pathogenic antibody or interacting with T cells in an inappropriate way and driving you know, inflammatory responses. And so what we've tended to focus on are things like where do B cells go? So trafficking, what do they make? Cytokines and chemokines, how do they interact with other cells? Antigen presentation, et cetera. And then how can we uh, manipulate those steps in a way that stops those inappropriate responses? And one of the things that we've worked on a lot is cytokines that are sort of really inflammatory cytokines that you often see in autoimmunity. Can we monopolize manipulate the way the B cells respond to those cytokines without changing their ability to respond to other types of cytokines? Um, and then can you tweak your the way that you vaccinate so that you can target the pathways that are non-inflammatory, if you want to call it that, um, so that you could presumably try to intervene with the bad without touching the good? Whether that will work or not, I don't know, but it's it's the way we're approaching it. So I, I really like that approach. And along those lines, I was wondering, putting on my pharmacologist slash practical industry hat, are there receptors that are like, because if it's a receptor, it's more druggable than an intracellular molecule. So are there yeah. receptors that are like coming to the top of your list of, of receptors on B cells that look like they can have this potential? Like, man, there's like these two or three that are really standing out that you think maybe that switch to hit. Yeah. So one of the things that we know is uh, that signaling through interferon receptors, whether it's type one or type two, in the setting of autoimmunity, that's one of the things that drives autoimmunity, right? And we know that B cells express both gamma receptors or interfering gamma and interferon alpha receptors. And we know that in the setting of lupus, for example, that some of the newest drugs that are coming out that have just been FDA approved are blocking interferon signaling, right? So. And some of those impacts are clearly on B cells. It's not the only thing, but it's at least one of the things that it's impacting. So our question is, okay, so if you're in a setting where people are being treated with block, blockade of interferon signaling, and maybe we can go further down and think about pathways that we can hit that are not just the receptor, but things that are a little bit further down, um, can so sort of like the jack inhibitors, right? Um, which are also being used in autoimmunity, for example. Can we think about how to vaccinate in a way that those receptors don't matter, right? And so how do we change our vaccines that we get the desired outcome in terms of generating memory B cells, generating lung with plasma cells and protective antibody, but don't have to go through those pathways. And so that's changing your adjuvant or thinking about your adjuvant in a way that you would target pathways that don't involve interferon signal. And so that's one of the things that we're thinking about, you know, in terms of other kinds of pathways that you might s manipulate. I think certainly, you know, chemokine receptors would be great, but the problem is they're really redundant, right? And so, you know, can you really come in with just a, a, a chemokine receptor blockade and assume that your cells won't get where they don't belong by some other mechanism? And the answer is probably no. Um, but I think thinking about some of those kinds of receptors, integrins, et cetera, that maybe you could displace them. So the best example of that is, you know, um, FTY720, for example, right? That's had a pretty big of impact in terms of how you manipulate trafficking. And can you use those kinds of, maybe not that one, but other things like that to, to change where cells end up? BCD immunology is such a... Um... Such a broad area to study, right? It, uh, given that B cells are involved in so many, uh, in so many diseases and so many uh, different um, responses, pathogens. What are the? What do you think are the most exciting areas of research in B cell 
uh, immunology at the moment, not necessarily maybe once you're involved or maybe people that other people are doing, where do you, do you see the kind of the, um, the, the field moving to? So I think one of the areas that's exciting and still understudied is how are the fate decisions of B cells uh, regulated? And in particular, are that how much predetermination is there? And so people have thought about this for a long time with T cells, right? For B cells, this is something that people are really starting to think about now and thinking about questions like, have memory cells undergone different kinds of epigenetic modification that even though if you look at their um, transcriptome, they don't look that different than a naive cell, but clearly they can respond faster, right? And so clearly things have changed for those cells that change the threshold that they can respond, how fast they divide, how fast they differentiate, et cetera. And trying to understand what regulates those epigenetic, first, what are those epigenetic processes? And second, how do you regulate them? And third, how do you uh, manipulate them in a way that you can get a desired outcome? Because as you can imagine, in the setting of autoimmunity, you may have long-lived plasma cells that are contributing to the antibody. But in fact, a lot of what people see is that the response is extra follicular. It may be naive cells, but it may also be memory cells. And so how do you change their capacity to respond uh, going forward? And I, you know, from my perspective, that's an important question. Another really important question is how does memory get formed in the first place? We know that the germinal center is required, but there is not a specific transcription factor like there is for becoming a plasma cell, where you know you have to turn on BLEMP1, you have to turn on XPP1, IRF4 has to be on. For memory cells, we know that if you get rid of some of the things that are important to get B cells all together, you don't get very good memory. But there isn't like a, a transcription factor that is um, specifically driving it right, that this is a fate transcription factor. And so if that's, and maybe we've just missed it, but if that's not, if that's the case, that it's not a fate specifying transcription factor, then how, how do all of those signals get integrated to allow that cell to live, you know, years, decades? And trying to understand that I think is really cool. And that's basic biology, it has practical implications, but it's really about basic biology. Oh, I love, I love it when the basic biology links up with the practical implications. And I have a feeling we could be here for a very long time continuing the discussion. But unfortunately, we do have a time limit. So we, we like to end with a fun question for you. And in this case, it's if you were not a scientist, what would you be? And you can't say a B cell. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I actually don't know what I would be if I were not a scientist. That's kind of sad. But I think the thing that I think is really cool, I love to travel. And so if I could pick anything, I would be a photographer or a writer for National Geographic so that I could go anywhere in the world. And it's sort of science-y because they write about things in some cases that are science-driven, but it's, you know, they write about all sorts of cool things and they go cool places. So that's what I do. Maybe they'll hire me. What sabbaticals for? <laughs> yeah. I was about to say, <laughs> that sounds like a very glamorous thing to do. Well, again, thank you very much. This is fascinating. We, we had been we had been in T cell biology for a while for some of our guests. So I'm excited to get some B cell action in there too. I know, although Brenda's favorite cell is still the T cell. It's okay. That's B okay. Matter. B cells are also <laughs> fine, I guess. <laughs> now they're great. They're great. Do you have a Twitter handle or anything else that people can follow you on? Are you looking for postdocs or grad students and want to shout out? Definitely looking for postdocs or grad students. Definitely. And um, if you go to uh, the UAB microbiology department website, you can find my lab website. It's got our Twitter handle. It's got our, um, you know, all the stuff. Come Perfect. find us. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for uh, coming on today. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at, at immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time.